All right, so let's start. My name is Dan Hank, this uh, Skull Session podcast, and today my guest is Nikki. Nikki, how do we pronounce your last name? Gallegos. Right. I, I didn't want to screw that up, so I was like, <laughs> I'll let you do that. It's the double L's in Spanish, you know? Right, right. Gallegos. Yeah. Well, I, I was even married to a lady from Colombia, and I saw I'm not good with Spanish. So it's, hey. yeah. <laughs> That's why I say right. Dr. G at work. It's much easier. <laughs> yeah. So where do you work? Um, so I work in central Illinois in like a little community ER. About okay. 18 beds. Yeah. So not it's not like massive by any means. Okay. And uh, so is, is that what you want to do for a living is that what you're you're doing to like that you enjoy doing to get you to the next level i mean what, what's your process yeah i mean i always wanted to be um a doctor like growing up i i always liked the idea of <laughs> the blood and the gore which should have you know told me something there but uh no yeah i do enjoy it uh, um it's, it's a lot of fun meeting people from different walks of life. And, you know, you can learn something from every single person you meet. Um, plus, you get to see some pretty cool shit sometimes. So, but yeah, I do enjoy it quite a bit. <laughs> I, I remember I worked uh, before I was, I was even like right now I own a tattoo parlor. Before I even owned that, you know, I, I worked at a ton of crappy jobs. And one day I worked at a restaurant and there was a lady that used to be an EMT there. And some of the best stories she told me ended up in my novels later on. Like, I, I remember there was a accredited train platform, and some guy, it was so crowded, he got pushed in front of the car, and, like, so the train hit him, and, like, it, it basically oh. twisted his body around, like, like you know, like candy cane, and so only his head was sticking out. So then, then like, the emergency oh. medical services got there, and they were telling him, they're like, Look, we can fly in your family if there's anybody you talk to, but basically you're dead. You're like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Just the train. They're like, no, no, you're dead. Like your whole yeah, like, body that would be is bad. like, like that a would, that would be yeah. Dude. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I thought that was pretty dramatic. But you know, there were a couple of stories like that. But uh, all right, so let's not focus on me. Let's focus on you. So what do you have going on? You want to give me a little, uh, little itinerary of uh, what what's in your life right now? Yeah. So. My debut novel, uh, The Broken Heart, will be coming out September 19th. So leading up to that, you know, hanging out with cool podcasters like yourself, uh, <laughs> missing Twitter, um, you know, waiting for ARC reviews. Otherwise, um, I am working on a little project. I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, I got a bit of an idea when I went to StokerCon about, uh, you know, some Swifties, some Stoker. Connie's some zombies so I'm working on uh it'll probably end up being like a novelette but uh I think it'll be pretty good <laughs> so um was writing something that you always had in mind or is that more is that more recent I always really enjoyed it um I embarrassingly kept a journal like you know middle school high school and now when I read it it's almost like a manifesto and I'm like Jesus Christ but you know anyway um I always enjoyed it but I did you know biology and chemistry in college um so I, the writing classes I did were like required and to be honest I kind of hated them because I hated how like subjective it was and then you know Oh, the chrysanthemum. What does that mean to you? What did the writer mean? Like, I couldn't stand that shit. But um, yeah, I mean, I always would like closet, right? You know, but I never really told anybody. Um, but like COVID happened, right? And initially work got pretty dead because nobody wanted to come in. And then you actually started seeing shit hit the fan. And I mean, a lot of people, you know, got pretty burnt out, as did I. So I had to turn to like an outlet to, the, you know, creative energy, get things out there. And I finally was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to go for it and see what I can do with this. I've always harbored a secret dream, but like I felt imposter syndrome -y, I guess maybe kind of saying it out loud. 
if they can help you evolve from like writing like notes in journals and all sorts of go, I'm going to make this a full novelization. I'm going to like tell a tale. I'm going to, I'm going to craft something bigger than like little bits and pieces. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it didn't actually start out with like the broken heart. Um, I have another um, novel, I guess, in the works, but I kind of abandoned that where, I had this idea of a doctor kind of extracting um, vigilante justice against like shitty people. You know, we, we run out into a lot of that, unfortunately, in the ER, you see like abuse, shitty people or doctors violence. extracting justice. <laughs> uh, not enough doctors extracting justice, unfortunately, <laughs> but shitty people. Yes. I mean, where do you see the dregs of society? Sometimes, you know, whenever somebody gets, Hurt, where do they bring them? ER, right? right? Well, I, I'm yeah, sure I mean, like the, the police and like the medical facility and so on. Like all, all those like service entry jobs, I'm sure they counter like the worst of the worst. I mean, right. it, I, I think it is, you know, it, it's kind of a, like a no brainer why the people of the DMV are so mad. Because, like, look at <laughs> what they have to deal with all day. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's something sometimes you see some pretty crazy stuff. And it's, it's it's sometimes difficult because you have to be um, impartial, I guess, you know, you have to provide the care, you have to pretend that they didn't do something horrible and just do what you have to do. But sometimes it is difficult to push that aside knowing things, you know what I mean? Right. All right. So going back to your writing for a minute. um... I feel like everybody, because there are so many authors out right now, and there there's like so much reference material available. Like there, and there's Kindle, and there's audio, but like, like it's almost like a like a oversaturation of everything. So I feel like people, mm-hmm. it really helps if you have an angle, not like a gimmicky angle, but like you know something that makes your stuff unique and different. Um, what would you say? Would you say like it was a, the medical um, profession? What, what would you say was your angle? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I I like the idea of medical horror, too. You know, a lot of the things that we do to people um, that are procedures, you know, if you really think about them, they're pretty freaking brutal. Um, you know, like, and seeing that every single day and doing it, it it definitely helps with like writing, you know, I mean, how many people can say that they've literally, you know, stabbed somebody in the ribs and like pushed through their muscles and felt their bones and stuff, you know what I mean? So it definitely helps. Well, is there like, is there a reference that you kind of think like that kind of captured what I want to bring to life or, like, are there movies or are there books or stories out there that you're like, that's kind of the vibe that I'm going towards? One I can think of that I really admire um, would be like Malignant. You know, I, it was maybe a little bit campy and over the top, but I thought it was pretty top notch um, medical horror. And I have to say, you know, your Tales of the Crypt hat, my <laughs> mom would totally let me watch that uh, as a kid, you know. And I very vividly remember uh, one episode. I can't recall exactly, you know, all of the players involved, but um, he must have been a scientist or a doctor. He found his wife cheating on him with another man. And they were like, oh, I want my body. And he, like, took their heads and transplanted them onto each other's bodies. And I was like, hell yeah. (laughs) It's like a six-year-old or whatever. You know what I mean? Do you remember the episode um, where, where it's like a, the like it, it's like a guy, a fitness instructor, is cheating. It, it's like a convincing guy's wife to cheat, and he buries him up to the neck in sand. And like the, the waves slowly come in and kill them, and they come back yeah. as like zombies. Yeah. Uh, I need to revisit that show and do a whole <laughs> rewatch. It is so good. Yeah, I, I think the first movie is better than the second by far. But there definitely are a couple, because they're stories. So I, I think there are a couple of uh, really strong stories in that one. Like, especially, I don't know if you saw the second one. Did you see it? Ah, not I can't recall, no. Uh, there's one where they're, like, 
on, on a raft in like the middle of a pond. And there's this like flesh eating like deer like oil slag that you know I, I don't know. I don't want to ruin it. Um, there are some stuff we're seeing that. You know, there's a bunch of things like yeah, but there's nothing that you're like uh, really to bother. <laughs> You know, like, like yeah. Punk three or something. You know, <laughs> like guy printing yeah. in the rubber suit. But um, so going back to your writing, um, people pick different ways to telling stories, like different perspectives. Like they tend to go with like first person or third person, occasionally second person, but they rarely do that. Um, and some people like to do a little bit of backstory, more like the Richard Matheson. You know, you write mm -hmm. I Am Legend, Hell House. And uh, to me, kind of the classic horror, like the Tales from the Crypt, whatever, is that Richard Matheson style where you kind of like build something up and then something shocking happens, where it seems mm -hmm. like a little bit more often these days, people like to throw shocking stuff in your face right away. And, and I feel like there there's less there. There's less meat to the story when people do that. I mean, some people can pull it off, but it is like, I think it's a little bit better if you like throw it and then you wind back and then you come back to it again. Mm -hmm. um, what's your approach? So I agree with you. I, uh, I like to do a bit of a build up as well. You know, um, I think it almost builds up a little bit more atmosphere at times to do it right. that way instead of being like, here's a bunch of blood. Here's a bunch of guts. Here's the main part of the story. Now we're going to go back here. But, um, I I find myself enjoying doing a first person um, because a lot of the times like with third person, I'll find myself like attributing things to like characters that aren't the main focus of the scene just because I, I don't know if I think it's because I'm a little witty or funny or something, but um, the, the, the broken heart, I definitely wrote first person, but initially it was third person. And it just, it wasn't working. So I had to go back through the entire thing and switch everything, but it was 100% uh, needed for sure. And I, I, I actually initially started it more like blah in your face and arrange things. And I think it flows much better now. Yeah, I feel uh, that reminds me because I, I just did um, one of the stories I did for the new anthology I have out. Um, like, I initially started in the first person. Like, first person is kind of my go-to. Like, I'm a big yeah. fan of H.P. Lovecraft. And, you know, more so, like, the way he tells the story than necessarily, like, his dialogue and his characters. Because I think his ideas are great. I think his dialogue is very much from the 30s. It's a little bit purplish, oh, yeah. a little bit, you know, over the top. But um, so I started out in the first person, and I like the immediacy of first person. But I feel like first person, you can run into danger there because it's kind of like the shaky cam of like writing, <laughs> you know, like the yeah. Blair Waste Project or the Cloverfield, you know. So it's like if you pull it off, it's great. If you can miss a mark, then you really miss the mark. You know? Yeah, that's true. But I, I wrote a story and like there, there's definitely a medical procedure in there. I mean, spoiler alert is all like, you know, like aliens experimenting on people and whatever, but still, I felt that I better capture the horror of it by putting it in first person and the person being subjected to it, and you're seeing through his eyes what is being subjected to, as opposed to just kind of describing what's going on. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Because you know, if you're feeling it, you're in it. I feel like that's a lot more horrible than kind of the third person more detached version you know right definitely yeah i, I know that like, i'm good oh I'm, I'm just curious what your medical procedure is if there's aliens is there you know rectal probing south park style you know no, Cartman? <laughs> no it, it's more like um i've kind of like maintained this theme like like originally i wanted to be a comic book artist and um and a comic book writer and one thing i I like about that is they, they maintain the continuity. So like, you know, even if something is like a different title, like 10 years later, it, it still might reference back to something earlier, you know? So they like mm -hmm. everything still lives in the same universe. So, you know, 
what I'm saying with that point is so what I tend to always kind of maintain the same theme with everything I do, which mm-hmm. is that like you have these like horrible kind of like almost love crafting creatures from like another dimension, you know, that mm-hmm. like you have a uh, higher ups and like the I wouldn't even say the US government, I'd say like the world government because they kind of feel like oligarchs rule everything. So you have they yeah. kind of combined with these creatures. And they, they want experiments on people. And, you know, in this story, like, there's somebody that they bred. this like a hybrid, but thinks it's human. And, like, it starts fucking up. And so they bring it in. <laughs> they strap it. So the guy wakes up strapped to a gurney with, like, this needle descending into his face. You know? And, oh, yeah. and I figure that's way more impactful if you're, like, the guy. You're like, what the fuck? You know, as opposed to, like, yeah, yeah well, this guy's on the gurney, and then this happens, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm picturing, like, the um, that torture robot off of Star Wars that's always right. going, yeah. Well, I was thinking a little bit, Um, have you seen the movie Fire in the Sky? Mm-mm, I haven't. It's actually really good. It's um, it's it's whenever Hollywood says based on a true story, it's always loosely based on a true story. But yeah, they get a lot of stuff. Whether it's right or wrong, they get a lot of stuff. Um, it impacts you. Like you, you really like the way they pulled the scene off. You know, there, there's some kind of embellishment. Like so, it, it's a uh, Travis Waltman is the guy that tells the story. He was like supposedly abducted by aliens while he was like up. Uh, on, on like like he was with some like uh tree cutters in the woods and like they had this alien encounter and stuff it, it's a really good story but it, it's um and he wrote a book about it and that book was it this was turned to a movie and he says well some of the stuff in the movie is a little bit like over the top and not quite what happened but it's kind of a, it's a good story but so if you yeah this is getting long, so I'll, <laughs> I'll cut to the point. The point is, I'm saying there are some scenes in it where you're like, "Yeah, I want to capture that." Like, like there, there's one where he's experimented on by aliens. I was like, "That's a great idea." It sounds good. I'll have to add that to my rotation for sure. I have so many movies to add on my, you know, to watch list. Right. Well, especially like, like. You know, I don't like horror when it's like straightforward, like just splatter. You know, I like it when like there's a story, that, especially like like cosmic horror, like Event mm-hmm. Horizon. I don't know if you've seen Event Horizon. Oh, yeah, yeah, loved so, Event Horizon. So like Event Horizon or Fire in the Sky or or Alien. You know, like they all have like like curious elements are thrown in there, mm-hmm. but. Uh, we we should talk movies all day. So getting back getting back to your story. So what what is kind of like uh what's kind of the impetus and the storyline behind it? So the broken heart follows Casey Phillips, who wanted, you know, the American dream, husband, kids, kinda fell into that script and things don't go quite as she planned, you know. Her husband's an alcoholic, kind of abusive douche. Um, Her son's kind of a Damien, the good son kind of guy. And she ends up getting pregnant and ends up suffering from um, heart failure, secondary to the pregnancy, and ends up getting a heart transplant from a serial killer. And as you can imagine, shit hits the fan because she gets fed up with uh, everybody's shit essentially a bit splattery for sure it seems like a couple of people have used like they've used like similar elements like have you seen the movie i think it's called the eye where some where somebody yeah. gets like eye transplants from a killer corneal transplant or something like that yeah Be- i came up with the idea <laughs> you want to know actually the best, best place where all ideas come up the bathroom at work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there and you know they, they put up um flyers chili day in the cafeteria Thursday or you know whatever and they had one for um like gift of hope so the organ transplant program and I, I was just like what if you got yeah transplant from a serial killer and then it just fucked you up 
and right. I couldn't get it out of my head. You know, I had to, I had to get it out there. But yeah, there there are a couple of stories like that. I would agree well, with that. I think I think it's kind of curious. It's like because there's so much we don't know. You know, it's like you would think that like the kind of mentality that made the serial killer serial killer would be in their brain. So it'd have to be like a brain transplant. But then you find that like the way that things function really affect your personality. Like people get hit by mm-hmm. cars and they have like a totally different personality. Or or they like a steel worker will have like, you know, like a workplace accident and a steel rod will be driven through his head. All of a sudden he has a different personality. So right. you know little things can it's like the butterfly effect, you know. So it's possible, mm-hmm. yeah, you know. Anything that you have, because it might change your, maybe it changes the way your your blood functions. I don't know. I mean, it, you, mm-hmm. you're right. There, there's so much we don't know. Well, and I can't remember what culture it is. So, but some ancient culture believed that your soul actually resides in your heart, which right. is kind of what got me thinking about that. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. What is it? The Phineas Gage thing where he got the railroad spike through his um, head and yeah, totally changed his personality. Well, um, that's it with no people to be shot with like a 22, you know, and like for mm-hmm. some reason, like the bullet didn't hit a vital part so they still live, but it does change the personality. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the same thing with um, like football players that or boxers that you know they get repeat head injuries and they get that yeah, trauma, um, yeah yeah that chronic traumatic encephalopathy or whatever where then they what is it chris benoit or whatever didn't they think that that's what happened to him and then he you know well there are a the bunch family. like there's kind of like a I, I don't even think it's really so much a joke it's just a commentary is it like i think 90 percent of all athletes go broke like they might have made millions of dollars, but their their logic and reasoning has been screwed up because they constantly get so much brain damage that they don't make good decisions with their finances after they retire. So they might have like three hundred million dollars, but by the time they die, they have like twenty grand in the bank. Yeah, and I'm sure they probably get taken advantage of to some degree by you know other people. But, and I'm sure yeah. I'm sure that's easier too when you have brain damage, because you know, oh, yeah. you're you're just not thinking clearly. Like they even think like I don't know if you heard of like the MA guy War Machine. Um, he was eating crazy mm-hmm. back. And, and um, was that yeah yeah? He Ooh, went crazy and just like bludgeoned her face. He's in jail right now for abuse, but it's like that was probably because he was like so beat up in the cage that you know. He just couldn't control his emotions. I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just saying that might have been a cause. I, I definitely think it contributes for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Have you seen that with your your patients? Like, do you have some patients that like have dramatic things and make them different? Oh yeah. Um, I'm most often it's drugs, to be honest. But yeah, <laughs> like we'll see people that. Uh, you know, you work in the same place, you see certain people over and over. And um, yeah, you'll see people get into accidents, and it'll dramatically change their personality. Or um, sometimes it'll be the thing that gets them on like the straight path, you know what I mean, too. But yeah, you totally see it. But it's definitely a lot of drugs there. (laughs) For sure. Yeah, well, probably the chemistry, because like, Basically, the chemistry of your body really affects the way you act, whether you get more exercise, whether you eat better, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, if you take drugs, that's definitely affecting the chemi- whatever the drugs are that are affecting the chemistry on different levels. Like, um, I know that some people are, like, really anti any medication whatsoever. Um, and I've always heard that there's, like, a big push from big pharma to have doctors always prescribe stuff um have you felt that at all at your job not so much um of that i i sometimes wish you know people always accuse us of oh every time you diagnose covid you get money or if you 
prescribe this, you get money. I was like, I freaking wish we got some money if we did all that shit. But no, it, I think it probably used to be worse whenever drug companies would, you know, they take doctors, send them to Bermuda with their entire family, give them a couple free pins. Yeah, prescribe this. But no, but a lot of meds that we do prescribe, like they're ungodly expensive, you know? And that's the only choice that a lot of people have. And when it comes to, I'm going to either take this medicine that takes up half of my monthly income, or I'm going to provide for my basic human needs, what are they going to pick, you know? Right. Well, I actually feel, I mean, this is a diversion, so we'll get off this, and not because we're not talking about your book. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel like the diversion is that, you know, a lot of people, you know, rather than, like, get healthy, they want to take a medicine to cover up something. And I think there's way less focus on what, you know, you can do. Like, like in med- I'm not saying this with you, specifically, but I'm <laughs> saying with a lot of, like, medical professionals, they're like, oh, well, take this pill. Oh, well, do this. they don't go, <laughs> hey, uh, why don't you run some more? Why don't you stop eating so much sugar, you know? Right. I think uh, that some of it's the American way, too. You know, you want a quick fix. You want a pill. It's going to fix everything. Yeah, well, I, I remember when, when COVID hit and they said 38% of Americans are obese. Not overweight, obese. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's going to look like, a, did you see the movie Wally, where everybody's like fat and they're in like a hover car? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all are on like hover around. Like, we're headed towards we're that so right massive. now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think a lot of, honestly, probably 90% of the stuff that we see is, I think, a result of um, shitty mental health services. You know, why do most people drink? Why do most people do drugs, overeat, you know, smoking, cigarettes, even you could say, because they're self-medicating. Right. I could go on a diatribe about that. So (laughs) About about people self-medicating? (laughs) <laughs> just how shitty our mental health and stuff you know it's not a priority in the united states you're supposed to just be tough and right. resilient and not talk about things not great well i think this is the last thing i'm saying this because we don't want to spend the entire time <laughs> talking about mental health but um i remember this guy I worked with and he was kind of bipolar um which it's probably pretty common, like more common than people think. But, mm-hmm. you know, if he didn't go, you know, like like he would do mountain biking. So if he went mountain biking in the morning, he was a pleasure to be with all day. If he didn't go mountain biking, he was a different person. And I know I go mountain biking with him. And, you know, it, like, I guess that little like, uh, like working everything out, you're you're breathing the air, you're getting a little bit of endorphins, you like mm-hmm. that would just level him out for the entire day. And I, I think that kind of like broadly that could apply to a lot of people. If they just did some stuff, you'd be surprised it how much it's not like, oh well, it just makes you look better or makes you whatever. It it actually improves the way that you handle everything. Absolutely. Totally agree. All right, so going back to your your book, <laughs> um, what was kind of like the slowness of COVID, kind of the genesis of like I should get up my ass and work on this? Yeah, it was. I did a lot of night shifts too, and not to say that it can't be an absolute disaster on night shifts because it can, but it does typically tend to be a bit slower. So, you know, occasionally, because it was so slow during COVID, we wouldn't have a patient check in for hours. And I was like, well, what else am I going to do? Read, but I started dabbling with the writing. um, And that helped. And then whenever everything got way shittier, uh, it definitely helped because it it gave me something to look forward to, I guess, outside of work. uh, Also, once you started a project, like now you're involved now this thing is real yeah Yeah. i I tend to be a person too that i want to like finish it you know i don't want to be somebody that stops something or abandons it right but yeah Yeah, it it definitely helps the people who actually make it somewhere finish their projects (laughs) like i I know so many people that start something 
they get a little discouraged. They get a little like I feel like you you just got to go for it. If it does succeed, it does succeed. But at least you tried. Exactly. I would rather know instead of wonder what if. Right. So you said, did you go to SoCon? You went to SoCon this year. I did. It was awesome. First SoCon. Yeah, okay. okay. And you did some of the panels and the seminars. Yeah, I uh, took part in a panel. Um, with make no mistakes about it. Avoiding medical mistakes in your writing. Yeah, no, and yeah, you know, I got to be yeah. with Bridget Nelson. You know, yeah. former OR nurse and and stuff. That was the only panel I was on, but I did attend several. And it was awesome. It was much better than medical conferences. I've been to. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, Bridges and uh, that new anthology I just released. Uh, it's like 14 authors and 16 stories, and uh, Bridget has a story there. Oh, but, nice. Yeah, Bridget's cool. Yeah, she's awesome. So when you did the panel, were you talking to um, any publishers? Were you talking to anybody, um, like any, maybe there were authors that you wanted to ask advice from or that you looked up to? You know, Aside from yeah. the panel, was there something that, you know, really grabbed you about SoCon? Just, man, how supportive everybody is. You know, people, they don't, like, in medical school, we have people called gunners that they will do anything that they can do to get on top. I'm, like, they'll go to the library and hide books or they'll buy all the books at the bookstore or things like that. <laughs> really? So they're willing oh, yeah. to backstab you to further the career. Yeah, exactly. They want to. They want to look good, so they're going to put other people down in a way to make what themselves they call, they're look called good. Gunners. Gunners. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I have experienced that. Just everybody in the horror community, especially you know the writing community, they're so supportive. You know, and. That it's kind of something to realize, you know, somebody else's success isn't necessarily threatening your success. You know, we right. gotta lift each other up. So that that was one of the things I was most, um, I guess, surprised by. Because not to say that medical people are necessarily like that, but you know, you kind of it's it's almost like a dick measuring contest at some of these medical conferences. You know, like I have this many publications. <laughs> So it was, no, it was very well, I know that happens, and it happens less with the authors, it seems. Like, it happens, yeah. like, like with, I've attended a lot of artist conventions, and artists are very much like that. They're very competitive, and some people can be like, like, even on this podcast, I remember I interviewed one artist, and, you know, when I started talking, if I wasn't talking about him, I could tell he was getting pissed off. Really? Like, yeah, <laughs> it was like. I just tried to have conversations. Like the whole thing about this podcast is I try to have conversations and I feel that it's more natural and to get more out of people. You know, so I was just trying to have a conversation. It was like, oh, but you're not focusing on how good I am. <laughs> it was like, okay, man. You're like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. But yeah, gunners. Now you, now you learn something there. They're totally <laughs> douchebag. <laughs> All right, so what are your plans in the future? Are your plans to, like, you know, expand this into a series, write some more books with different stories? Like, are you trying to maintain a continuity like like comic books do? You know, what, what, what do you have in mind? I do like the idea of producing a sequel to The Broken Heart, which would follow Casey, you know, extracting justice on shitty people. Um, but right now I am, um, I have a first draft. that's not very good, but I'm going <laughs> through it now. And, uh, it's a story about a neurologist that invents, um, migraine chip chips. Cause a lot of people, you know, they, they'll do anything to stop suffering from migraines. They'll, they'll literally eat a turd to stop having migraines. They'll try all these like meds, you know? So she makes these chips but then she realizes that she can control people with them. And she's not altogether a, uh, she's a bit nefarious. So I think, uh, I think you might have like a, a really unique angle there with the, the whole, like kind of like a medical angle. Cause I feel like a lot of people don't do research. 
like maybe it says I'm a little bit OCD, but I'm like anything I write about, I want to do a deep dive into before I write about it because I really don't want to get called out. Like you know, yeah. I did a story about like a there's like this alien creature of the Loch Ness, but I'm thinking of like the Loch Ness monster. So I actually went on vacation in Denver and I took the bus tour up to the Loch Ness and like you, you take like a tour boat across Loch is their, their word for lake. So I took a, a tour, you know, boat across the Loch so so I could I could see what it felt like. You see it's in the highlands, you know. Now I know that because I went there. So I, yeah. I feel like like delving into it and having like those like you know those exquisite details really help bring it to life. And I feel oh, like you might yeah. have that with like the the you know medical details that a lot of people, even if they wanted to write the story, if they're not in the profession at all, they wouldn't really they wouldn't even know how to bring that stuff up. Yeah, it's it's definitely helpful. I've uh not that I want to call anybody out, but um, there's a, what is it called? Nosferatu, the Joe Hill story. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, it's, he's meaning, I think, an EEG, which is like the little things that they put on your head to right. monitor for like seizures and brainwaves. And he says EKG instead, which is the one that, you know, checks your right, right. heart. And it, it just surprises me because it's, it's a great book. But right. how did it get through, you know, so many, um, so much editing? And nobody caught that. It, and it's right. it's a very like obvious thing. Um, and I think it, I mean, it's unique in emergency medicine because you you have to know a little bit about everything. You have to know a little bit about every specialty. The first, you know, the emergency stuff, and then you kind of pass it off. So I'm kind of uniquely positioned to understand I think a little bit about everything whereas a lot of specialties like a nephrologist they know about the kidneys that's it well probably you would have a medical professional proofreading his book that's probably where that happened I I know that like what really got me like kind of lit a fire under my ass to get my first book out was a guy wrote a book like it was a zombie apocalypse book, but one of the main characters was a tattoo artist. And at the time, I was like in all the magazines and everything. So he wanted to get a hold of me to see, like, you know, how realistic his perspective of tattoo artist was. And he sent it over to me. Like he sent me, a, I don't remember if it was like an ebook file, but I remember I read it and I was like, all right, this is a horrible portrayal of a tattoo artist. Like, there's a bunch <laughs> of stuff here that anybody who tattoos would go, no, that would never happen. You know, but he listened to me and he changed it. And I was like, you know, and then they evolved to like, oh, well, uh, what's your publishing company? Yeah, I'm working on something, you know. Yeah. But yeah, you if you're delving into something, you definitely need to do the research. But I feel oh, like yeah. you have an angle with the, the medical stuff. I, I like uh, I like your... You said that it's a poor draft right now, but I like the work that you're working on. What's it called again? The um, the migraine one? Yes. Um, I, I have a working title. It's called uh, Dr. Absence Miracle Migraine Chip, but I might shorten that at some point. Right. What do you think of uh, like the Elon Musk putting like the, you know, the chip in your brain? You know, have you heard about that? I've I've heard things about it. Um, there's part of me in a way like, okay, we get these people, these patients that are like a John Doe, you know, absolutely nothing about them. They come in, you don't know if, what they're allergic to, what what they have, things like that. And I've often thought of like, well, I'm sure you know, people we might lie chip too. our pets. Oh, yeah. So you, we might start chip pets. How awesome would it be if you were able to just like, scan something and you're like oh you're allergic to penicillin you have this these are the meds you take like it would make our lives infinitely easier but i i feel like you're but then you also think control, people can you know? control you it could be like this could be the beginning of like skynet or whatever the matrix you know exactly or yeah any black mirror episode where <laughs> you know they're doing that kind of shit but 
Um, well, and people even do that now. Like they they can hack um, pacemakers or defibrillators and, and things oh, really? because a lot of times, oh yeah, you can. Um, so when somebody comes in with a defibrillator, so it's you know it shocks you if you're in a bad heart rhythm, and they'll come in and we can actually interrogate them like wirelessly to see you know, why did it shock, what was going on, things like that, and people can hack into stuff like that and then i mean in theory you could shut something off and bam you know well so what you're basically saying is like the movie revo man is not so far removed from the truth <laughs> not necessarily yeah i you know you're not supposed um well they're making stuff differently now but there's a lot of things that you know you're supposed to tell people at the airport oh i have a pacemaker because you're not supposed to go through certain things and they'll take you and frisky you elsewhere but yeah it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility i feel like a lot of people at like the airport they're doing all the scan and stuff they're not really paying that much attention <laughs> like, no. like like you know how many terrorists they've caught ever since we've had like the nsa <laughs> I, I probably not very many how many is it zero <laughs> <laughs> I was right, <laughs> but all right. So I want to keep you here too long, and I, I'm trying to shorten up the episodes a little bit. But um, do you have something else that you really want to get out? And you got to tell me how people can contact you and find your book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously, I would love if everybody would pick up a copy of The Broken Heart, which, as I mentioned, comes out. September 19th. Uh, you could pre-order it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Spooky underscore ER. Dr. Um, Spooky. <laughs> Dr. I feel like Spooky. you should be like on House of a Thousand Corpses or something, but go ahead. Sorry. I, I would ideally love that. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Maybe in a couple of years, you know, whenever I lose my mind, but, and then I do have a website. Um, so, N J G A L L E G O S dot com Gallegos. And you know, you can find um you know links to my blog, um links to buy my other stories. And I would advise anybody if they wanted to pick up anything that's uh grizzly. I have a splatterpunk story in um Hellbound Books anthology of splatterpunk that follows a doctor that does pretty awful shit to a rapist. But, I mean, you're kind of <laughs> rooting for her because fuck them, right? <laughs> That's kind of a... The premise, but it's also a werewolf story, <clears throat> is in Bridget's contribution to my anthology. Like, and, oh, and she works at a doctor's office. So mm. she's like a medical professional, but she's really a werewolf, and she gets raped, and yeah. I, I uh, No spoiler alerts, but I... Uh, it didn't go well for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Things did not go well. I'll be yeah. picking that definitely up. But okay, yeah, awesome. So. Well, it was awesome to have you on the show. Do you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, stay new to your pets. Uh, buy the broken heart. Uh, leave a review, and be reviews kind to help. Each other. Reviews. People don't even realize reviews really help. Oh, they do. You know, ideally a five star, you know, if you're going to leave a one star, <laughs> how about you don't? But, but, you know, whatever. You're Are you really an artist if you don't have a one star review somewhere? <laughs> it's true. It, it, there's so many Karens out there, like people that just hate to hate, you know? Exactly. But um, Exactly. So you got to just say, fuck it. <laughs> well, and more importantly, don't be discouraged. Just keep rolling exactly. through because not everyone's going to like your stuff. And to be honest, I don't want everyone to like my stuff. You know, <laughs> I think you're, you're exactly. doing something right if you have some haters. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But totally all right, agree. Nikki, so thank you very much for being on here. And uh, I appreciate the interview and everybody check out your book. Give a shout out to your book again. The Broken Heart out the September 19th, Medical Horror Slashers. Go for it. <laughs> okay, awesome. 
All right, everyone checking it out. Check Nikki out. And uh, we're looking forward to some good stuff in the future from you. Thanks for having me on here, Dan. Appreciate it.